Welcome back to U.S. History. We're picking up at Roman numeral two, domestic reform. Hopefully you've done the homework and taken the quiz that I mentioned yesterday already. And now, so everything we've discussed so far has to do with uh, the Cold War and foreign affairs and dealing with all those problems. We kind of skipped around from Truman to Eisenhower to Kennedy. Now we're going back to what's happening in America. What is the U.S. doing for itself during this same time frame? So, president after World War II was Truman. While the U.S. was waging the Cold War on foreign issues, there were also issues to deal with at home. Each president will have a slogan for his domestic policies. Truman's slogan was the fair deal. This was the name of Truman's domestic goals. What did the fair deal look like? And yeah, it's, it's a play off of the old square deal, the old new deal. And so now Truman continues it with his fair deal. So what was the legislation of the fair deal? First of all, letter A. He wanted federal spending to ensure jobs for the unemployed. Um, that plan was actually rejected. Conservatives saw this as too much power and money in the hands of the government, and so they vetoed it. They didn't want to have uh, federal spending to ensure jobs for the unemployed. And basically, the idea is we can't expect the government to do all of that. Letter B. One thing that Truman did get passed was the Employment Act. The Employment Act created an agency that would advise the president on the economy. Another thing that happened was the Atomic Energy Commission. The Atomic Energy Commission gave control over atomic energy to civilian rather than military authorities. Uh, this was important because just as we saw with the situation with MacArthur and Truman, civilian authorities always should be superior to military authorities. The president is a civilian leader. The military should not be able to uh, overthrow a president, should not be able to enforce their law upon the people. The military should be the servant of the government. Oh, by the way, uh, you may have noticed two videos that I've added to the uh, playlist. I found these videos online. The first one is a very short excerpt, the conclusion of MacArthur's speech before Congress. I could have put up the 30-some minute uh, speech, but I wasn't expecting any of you to actually watch that, so I highlighted it with the last one minute or so of that speech. And then second of all, I, gave, I put up on there a speech that um, John F. Kennedy gave when he was in Berlin, the Ich bin ein Berliner speech. Uh, that he gave concerning the construction of the Berlin Wall, which we talked about yesterday. So if you're interested in, in any extra information, uh, just to see what life was like or see what people were like at, during that time period, uh, watch those videos. It'll be helpful for you. However, Truman became unpopular to the people. America was dealing with economic problems, foreign policy setbacks, and charges of communism in the government. Truman and the Democrats suffered in popularity. <laughs> As one Republican's wife said, to air is Truman. <laughs> in the 1946 election, the Republican slogan was simply, had enough? And in the election itself, Republicans took control of Congress for the first time since 1928. Letter D, the Taft-Hartley Act. This act was actually created by Republicans. It was vetoed by Truman, but it was overridden anyways. It was an anti-union law that banned what was called union shop. Uh, union shop required union membership as a condition for hiring. So basically what the Taft-Hartley Act did was uh, if you had to be part of a union in order to get a job, that was now illegal. You could get a job without having to be a part of a union. There was also an 80-day cooling off period for strikes in businesses involving national interests 
and union leaders had to swear that they were not communists. So this was a Republican law. Uh, Truman didn't like certain parts of it, so he vetoed it, but it got passed anyways. Letter E, the National Security Act. Because of World War II, including the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, it became obvious that the different divisions of the U.S. military had to communicate better so as to avoid another, well, Pearl Harbor. The National Security Act created the cabinet position of Secretary of Defense. A Secretary of Defense would be the head of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Before this time, there were actually two cabinets, one for the Army and one for the Navy. The National Security Council and the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, were also created to assist the president in foreign policy matters. Number one, the election of 1948. So remember, how did Truman become president? Oh yeah, FDR died, and since then... Truman has been president by default. Well, now we see Harry S. Truman running for president on his own merits. He's going to run as the Democratic candidate, and yet he will face many obstacles to being reelected, some from the Republicans and others from his own party. Henry A. Wallace, he, was, he formed his own party called the Progressive Party, not the same party as Theodore Roosevelt's day. It was his own version of the Progressive Party. In fact, I put up there, it was the almost socialist party. Wallace, a little background about Wallace, he had been the Secretary of Commerce before Truman had fired him because of his pro-Soviet positions. He ran under the Progressive Party. Wallace believed that the government should be more involved in the economy and people's lives. So as a progressive party candidate, he is going to take the most liberal of the Democrats into his camp. Another individual running for president was a man by the name of Strom Thurmond. He formed a third party called the Dixiecrat Party. Angry with Truman's civil rights record, conservative Southern Democrats formed the Dixiecrat Party, and nominated South Carolina Governor Strom Thurmond as a state's rights candidate. So, as I just said, Strom Thurmond's going to take the conservative Southern Democratic vote with him. And the man who is going to profit from all this will be the Republican candidate, Thomas Dewey. After all, we've got three Democrats running for president. Normally, that splits up the votes and will allow the other party, Thomas Dewey, to win. Optimistic of victory, Republicans chose the popular governor of New York, Thomas Dewey. Uh, Truman, however, didn't think he was going to lose. Uh, he performed what became known as his whistle-stop campaign train tour. He set out on a 31,000-mile campaign, crisscrossing the nation. He appeal appealed to labor and blacks in the cities, as well as farmers in the Midwest, hoping to keep the old New Deal coalition alive. When the Republican Congress refused to enact Truman's Fair Deal agenda, uh, Truman called it the Do-Nothing Congress and used it to his advantage. Although the polls continued to run against him, Truman pressed on. Truman once said, I wonder how far Moses would have gone if he'd taken a poll in Egypt. What would Jesus Christ have preached if he'd taken a poll in Israel? It isn't polls or public opinion of the moment that counts. It's right and wrong. And I think that's something to consider as well. Polls give an idea of what public opinion is at the moment. But polls can be wrong. Opinions can change. And so while you know they give you a good idea, they shouldn't be the final word on the popularity of a president. Although Republican Thomas Dewey came close to becoming president, sorry I gave away the end of the story, it was not because of his warm public personality. With friends and in private, Dewey could joke around and be himself, but in the public eye, he seemed to freeze up. 
He was compared to the groom on a wedding cake. Someone once said after meeting him, I don't know which is the chillier experience, to have Tom ignore you or shake your hand. The media worsened the situation by highlighting his stiffness and photographing him looking as rigid as possible. One reporter said, Dewey doesn't seem to walk. He coasts out like a man who has been mounted on casters and given a tremendous shove from behind. End result? Truman wins. He didn't just beat Dewey. He beat him easily in one of the biggest upsets in the history of presidential elections. Many Americans went to bed thinking Dewey had won. They woke up to a surprise. If you look at page 538, there's a picture of a famous photograph that was taken of um, Truman holding up a newspaper that shows Dewey defeating Truman. Obviously, that did not happen. The, the newspaper was written prematurely. And then on page 539, it shows you a, a map of the election of 1948. You can see the actual results. And Truman's victory was complete. Congress, now, now that Truman won again, Congress passed more of the fair deal. This included raising the minimum wage, extending social security coverage, and giving more aid to farmers. Yet some of Truman's fair deal was also rejected, such as civil rights bills, federal aid to education, and national health insurance. Number two, anti-communism in America. Uh, there was a new Red Scare. Just as a Red Scare had occurred after World War I, Another Red Scare occurred after World War II. Anything subversive was blamed on communist infiltration in the U.S. government. Uh, one example of con uh, this Red Scare taking place was a man by the name of Elger Hiss. This was probably the most sensational communist case. case sorry. Hiss, a former government official, was accused by Whitaker Chambers, a former Soviet agent himself, for passing secret government documents. So, Hiss was accused of being a communist spy, in short. Although he could not be accused of espionage because the action had occurred over 10 years before, he was convicted of perjury when he denied the accusations under oath. So, he had been a spy, but they couldn't convict him of that because of time. So they convicted him of perjury instead. A man by the name of Richard Nixon, maybe you've heard of him before. The Elger Hiss case launched the political career of Richard Nixon, who aggressively worked to put Hiss in jail. He would become a leader in the anti-communist crusade, and that's probably what you need to know about him. The Hiss case made his career, and he would be seen as an anti-communist crusader. Another pair of individuals involved with the Red Scare was actually a married couple, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The couple had been working through a British-American spy ring and ha was convicted of passing atomic secrets to the Soviets during World War II. So they had given s atomic secrets to the Soviets during World War II. They were convicted of, be of treason and executed in 1953 for that treason. If you look in your books, uh, turn in your books, please, page 540. Please read the box entitled A Couple of Spies to Yourself. Once you finish, please unpause, and we will continue. U.S. loyalty programs. In light of the Hiss and Rosenberg incidents, the U.S. quickly reacted to more possible threats. Truman instituted a loyalty program to check federal employees. The House Un-American Activities Committee investigated in-depth studies on communist activities as well as their influence in the entertainment industry. The government passed a law which made it easier to combat espionage. Joseph McCarthy and McCarthyism. He was a senator from Wisconsin. He is most closely associated with the Red Scare campaign. That's what you need to know about him. McCarthy once declared that he had a list of names of communists who worked in the State Department. He continued to make bold accusations against members of government and ordinary people. While fighting communists was a popular move, he was unstoppable. And we'll find out what happened to him tomorrow.